Welcome to Defender Fridays, everyone. Um, as you all know, this is our weekly rendezvous to come together with all these awesome folks that you see here um, and uh, and have a conversation, right? Uh, just kind of a casual fireside chat with uh, someone that we've we've identified out in the field that might have some interesting insights to share with us. And I'm I'm really uh, really uh, happy to announce our guest today, Jamie Williams. So Jamie and I exchanged a couple of tweets the other day. Um, I, I posted a little diagram, kind of outlining. The, uh, the the flow of communication in like a modern SOC team. And it was just something I'd like sketched out really quickly uh, while on a, a consulting call. And, and I said, hey, you know, somebody out there might find this useful. And I put it out there and and Jamie got a hold of it. And he actually added a couple uh, of annotations and some additional thoughts. And I was like, yes, I mean, those are, that's 100%. I love it, you know, because he, he, he very properly uh, identified a missing communication flow between, for instance, an IR team and uh, CTI, right? Your your threat intel folks. Um, you know, basically the sharing of indicators that are being uncovered by an IR team uh, is obviously cr uh, critical. And and it, my my lame excuse was I was just trying to keep the diagram just a little bit simpler. But it, his his input was 100% uh, relevant. And so uh, and Jamie, so Jamie, uh, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. I know you're over at Mitre, right, working on attack for enterprise. So I, I love that diagram because that's something that we fight to try to translate to folks is, hey, like I've, I've been in that chair where you're Intel and you're just kind of throwing stuff over the fence. And that's kind of my role with attack is like we publish and put it on a website and then it's just like, OK, good luck, everyone, like figure it out. So like actually, and I love the, the kind of frame that we're talking about here is like what is like real, like not strategic operational tactical Intel, but like what is like real, like so what Intel actually look like? And I think it's exactly what you captured in that diagram is like, hey, don't just like chuck grenades over the fence. Like we really like, and that's a lot of what we're doing at MITRE is like, how do we actually understand like what operations are doing and like more importantly, meet them where they are. Like rather than giving them like a 40 page report about like, you know, some adversary across the world, like that's good stuff, awesome research. But like, if all you're doing is like working with a firewall and blocking malicious IPs and domains, like what are you going to do with that PDF? Like it's, it's useful. It's interesting. It's bar trivia. But like that's honestly not necessarily with my attack hat, but like a lot of the rest of the work I do at MITRE is like trying to figure out like how do you connect those dots, connect that tissue and actually make Intel like change, not change the world in like a cheesy way, but like actually influence the way you red team, blue team, do procurement, do mergers the way you train staff, the way you actually give people titles, give people recognition. Like it's not, not saying like Intel is going to solve the problems, but it's definitely like all of those security minded decisions can be influenced in a positive way. If exactly as you captured in that diagram, if you're like thinking about it in the right way and kind of connecting all those dots. And yes, Jeff, it is actually, ironically, that's the only reason I'm in the office today because I'm like, after we hop off this, I'm handing in my computer and like, yeah, oh. good, good stuff. Well, it's your what's, last call. <laughs> what's what's in uh, what's in store for you, Jamie? Oh, I got a, a nice, healthy, uh, fun employment. Gonna like sit back and like tweet and drink probably wine and take a couple good naps. Congratulations! That sounds like a good time. Something I'm curious uh, to get your thoughts on. So um, I know I've I've spoken with a lot of orgs at you know various different you know uh, maturity levels and sizes. And, um, and the question I have to get is like, at what point can you justify having an internal CTI function, right? Like does, you know, does the, the, the hundred employee company need this? Does the thousand employee, does the 10,000, you know, or are there other sort of gating factors to say, like, when is it appropriate to have a dedicated CTI role within your SOC team? And obviously we're, 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 we're starting with the assumption that you have a SOC team of some kind. Maybe it's just a handful of analysts looking at a seam, but like, where's the, where, in your, in your opinion, what is, what is the evolutionary scale to kind of get to dedicated threat intel? Uh, table stakes. Um, and it, it matures from like, even if you're just a small shop with a couple of people, like you can put on an Intel hat, like, Hey, you're doing remediation. You're doing, you know, alert triage. Like there's no reason that you can't. And I think even to your point, like, Intel doesn't need to be creating products and the sophisticated research. It could just be enrichment of like, hey, like we're getting phishing emails, like rather than just kind of like doing our normal quarantine and our cleanup and like, you know, rinse and repeat and move on. Why don't we take a look at what is that? Like, what can we learn about that? Is that a known campaign? Is that a known adversary? What would happen if they click it? Can we start to like, can we pivot on that and like come to some bigger insight? So again, it could start, I think 
a lot of the time the folks I coach is like, you know, you could start with an Intel team that's half a person, maybe, you know, one intern on a Friday afternoon. Like it really, I think when you get into like the more sophisticated, like you said, like a dedicated team, I think that comes with um, a little bit of a higher like cost of entry. But I think my answer to that is it's all relative towards ops. Like, hey, like rather than saying, let's build an Intel team and figure out where they can add value, let's reverse engineer that and saying, what are we doing on the ops side? And where can Intel provide value? And then how much does effort does that take? And can we mirror like, hey, we have a whole team, we have 10 threat hunters. How much are they asking for in terms of Intel? Let's like prototype it with one person or half a person, see how much like what it looks like and then scale out and let the business and let ops kind of grow the shape, size, sophistication, focus, all the variables of Intel. So I think what otherwise, I think the trap I've seen people fall to is like, you build like you, hey, we have 100 people. I feel like we should have five Intel folks. And you build on, put all these resources, and you end up building an island where the Intel folks are off on the side doing their own thing. Yeah. And that's when you end up these like daily briefs are like, oh, cool. Like that's slick. That's awesome. So what? Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like this, this like piece of malware or this, we don't even have those systems. Like that's really neat, but like, come on. Like that's just, it's, it's siloed off. It, it's funny that you say that because, um, the conversation I was having when I sketched that diagram, um, one of the problems I was helping that org solve was they had the CTI function and it was an island. And it was, there were, it was so disjointed that basically the, the op side of the house would have to submit a ticket to the Intel side of the house uh, for, hey, you know, can we get some information on this campaign, this threat actor, this what have you, right? Or enrich this IOC or whatever. And there'd be like a week turnaround time to get it. I'm like, by the time you got that response, the answer was no longer relevant. <laughs> like, I'm like, there's something wrong here, right? Like the, the, there's there's too much friction. This team's not talking to this team. There's no bi-directional flow. And there's certainly no automated flow of information. And I, I you know, kind of helped them identify like that's a that's a critical sort of uh, breakdown right there of um, of efficiency. Um, so yeah, that's and and I also like something else that you said, and I, I wholeheartedly uh, agree with this that really Intel needs to kind of be a little bit of everybody's job, yeah. even even on the small team, right? On the small team where you, you don't have a dedicated Intel, uh, there needs to there needs to be an Intel mindset, yeah. I think, among the 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 sort of jack of all trades analysts that you have sort of powering and yeah. in, in, an early level sock, right? Right. And I think um, I have a slide somewhere and I should find it and like tweet it one day. But like exactly to your point, like I think the thing I hate is Intel trying to exist and operate on its own. When to your point, like even if you're an Intel nerd and you're like really obsessed with like the Intel like cycle and all the phases, planning direction, dissemination, feedback, like you can't do that without your audience, without your stakeholders, without your customers. Like whoever, whether you're a threat hunter, red team, executive, whatever, you are invested and in actually, you know, executing in that cycle. So if Intel's doing that on their own, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So I think exactly to, like, I'm kind of watching the chat a bit as well. Like we always like have this like big mantra of like, hey, you're building an Intel shop. You got to get your PIRs, get your priority information requirements, get your information needs. Like that's not something that you just kind of like, oh, I'm going to go like ask someone like, can you tell me your Intel PIRs? It's more exactly as you said, like I'm going to go watch how we threat hunt. I'm going to like figure out like, what do you actually do? What are all the decision points you make? How do you see problems? What are you actually capable of? And rather than asking that question, you can almost derive like, oh, cool. Like, it would be really wicked if I gave them a bunch of cool hashes or like, hey, they see a big thing in the headlines like, oh, APD 28 this, APD 41 that. And they have a hard time figuring out, does that matter? Or like, is that something we should even hunt? So like being able to decompose those questions, like literally just questions into like not even full answers, but just like nudges in the right direction. That's what we're really talking about in terms of actionability. Like it's it's so simple. But I think people are really scared to do less. And like, it doesn't need to be the smartest thing in the world. It just needs to be like, oh, cool. Like you were going to go red team rather than just kind of like, you know, jamming into your favorite, like, you know, tool. Why can I give you a little direction on like the kind of stuff we're worried about and the kind of stuff that we're actually going to try to defend and the actual stuff we could actually defend. And even if it changes it like 2%, it's 2% better. I like that because I'll, I'll admit that I've only really thought about, you know, Intel informing defensive operations like like threat hunting and things like that. Um, but that's an interesting and, and not 
I mean, it, it, it's a trivial thing. It's just, it, I've just never thought about it, but using Intel to inform adversary emulation, right? Like using Intel to inform your pen test, because I, I agree, right? Why should this, this, this scenario, this attack plan be, be sort of, you know, sketched out in a silo of someone who maybe doesn't know the threat model, of the organization doesn't know what, you know, what, what our, what our controls or potential weaknesses are like, let's inform that and, and make it a more effective test. I don't know, Jeff, I know you do some offensive stuff. What do you think about that? I was just posted in, in chat about that, but yeah, absolutely. Like it is so common. I, uh, I think, uh, Katie Nichols often refers to, uh, uh, proper villains versus is this a red team or is this a pen tester? And I, I, I kind of loathe pen testerisms, things that are more commonly done by pen testers than real world threat actors. So, uh, yes, in a uh, pen test and more so in the red team, the, the goal of the red team is to exercise the blue team. And if you're not exercising the way that you expect a real threat actor to exercise the blue team, if you're using completely different techniques, et cetera, whatever is most convenient to the red team, are are you really training as you fight? Are you really like, are you really testing the way that you will be tested later in real life? One of my favorite examples of that is like, if you played bingo with like Mimi Cat's flags and like, how many do you see from like real threat actors? Like you would never win because it's just like, oh, cool. Like else has dump. Like what else would they possibly do versus like if you like, you yeah, know, if we do APT Jeff, you're going to see all kind of like this and that and like whatever. And like, what do you I mean, those are not saying those are bad behaviors, but like especially with limited resources that really we're going to spend our time like we have, you know, red, red team resources and red team time is so precious. Like we really need to make the most of every second of it. And like if we're just chasing hypotheticals when we actually have realities right in our face like what how do you sit back and say that's a good investment and the roi is really there yeah Re rephrasing a bit there's essentially an infinite number of detective controls you could put in place prioritizing those is kind of a big deal so why would you prioritize based on generic pen test firm versus the actual threat groups you'll be up against and the actual techniques you'll be up against hey so jamie something you said just a second ago um spurred a question for me so so i'm pretty intimately familiar with the types of metrics that socks can use to kind of demonstrate their effectiveness and their efficiency and you know their continuous improvement but uh zooming in on a cti what kind of metrics can cti use to also demonstrate and i obviously you know i'm not looking at the uh vanity metrics like oh we're tracking 500,000 iocs that we downloaded from you know some csv somewhere like what are some real world metrics that can help move the needle on a process improvement for a threat intel team? I'm absolutely going to steal that like vanity metrics because like I think like every intel shop has dive like dove into that and like, oh, we're doing 30,000 indicators a week or we have like 10 product lines and this is what we're doing. I think it's if you think about what the function of CTI is, it's decision support. My favorite metric is who are you supporting? Like, hey, mm -hmm. like rather than just going on, like we have all these feeds, we have this tip, we have all this like infrastructure, we have all these analysts with their degrees and their pedigrees and whatever. It's like, okay, cool. Like who are your customers? Like you, su you support threat hunt, IR, detection engineering, red team, executives. How many products are you making for them? At re what repetition? And so what? What is the desired workflow? Like, hey, you're processing indicators. Are you putting them into packages for like AV updates? Are you blocking things in the firewall? Are you doing enrichment for IR? And I think the funny thing about that is it ends up, you get some quantitative in terms of like some of that kind of nitty gritty stuff, but it ends up being a lot more qualitative of rather than having Intel tell me your metrics and your success stories, let your audience say what matters. Like, hey, threat hunt, we went and found a bunch of crap we never would have known about. And it was only because Intel brought it to our attention. Or, hey, our red team is actually building a lot of really interesting controls because we're getting scoping and we're getting help from Intel. So again, I think it's a little bit of a paradigm shift, but your metric isn't, the aperture for who you're measuring isn't just your Intel team, it's your Intel team plus the so what. You kind of have to like open it up a little bit and saying, what is this Intel actually doing? Because otherwise, again, to your point, it's all going to be vanity. It's going to be, oh, cool, we're slinging a bunch of stuff, PDFs are flying everywhere, and uh, cost center. I dig it. I like it a lot. Because at the end of the day, it, it not one of these functions really can uh, drive metrics alone, right? Like it, it is kind of a team effort, right? So I, I appreciate that that insight. That's really good, really solid perspective. Yeah, I, I'm not an economist uh, by trade, but like 
you've been enough in those conversations where you're like, why, like end of the year, like, why should we keep doing this? Or like, how do we know if we're winning? And you're like, it should be, especially with Intel, it's hard because it's like with like blue teaming and every other function, you have like something tangible where like, if you don't pay attention enough, Intel just be, it becomes like a stream of just like stuff. And you're like, great, we're like bringing data in and turning it into other data. And now you're just, do you feel smart? Like, is that a good like success factor? So you yeah. really have to be a little bit surgical of like, hey, like, like I'm a big fan of like do less better and just start small, do what makes sense and kind of like ease your way into it, which I guess, uh, is that an InfoSec economist? Maybe that's a new <laughs> tag. Pick, pick the right metrics, right? Because uh, every metric will be gamed. And I, I, I'm going to throw some, uh, some cold water on. I don't think Blue Team has easy metrics either. Uh, of, I don't think any team has easy metrics that are useful and can't be gamed because to some extent, every game is a game and every game will be gamed. Uh, if it's how many boxes or how many patches have we deployed the last week, then sweet, I'm going to slow roll the patches on these machines all the time. Like, Let's deploy a whole new dev stack in order to just a patch. Like every game can be gamed. Uh, picking good metrics can get you a lot of the way in the right direction, but there, there's a lot more to it. Like oh, if what? at some point CTI done, done badly is a bunch of people browsing Twitter all day yeah. and putting reports in like, hey, I found 30,000 hashes <laughs> today. Cool. But hashing hot. hot take, and this is a good person to have on for it. Uh, if if your threat intelligence feeds or you are producing bad domains and bad hashes, then you're doing it wrong. Uh, yeah. It's essentially stake oil at that point. You're buying burned uh, threat intelligence, like burned right. uh, attacker infrastructure. You, 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 you say that, but I, I can I can recount at least two times um, that. We, you know, I was on a pretty high profile IR. We extract an indicator from some malware or something. And um, the you know, multiple vendors had no detection for this IOC. Mm -hmm. We go back and we find a tweet from a year ago, somebody attributing it to uh, nation state. And it's like, so Twitter was the, the highest fidelity Intel stream for this particular indicator yeah. in, in this one case. And then, yeah, you submit the tickets to Palo Alto or Cisco or whomever. They're like, oops, sorry, it, we're adding it to our feed now. <laughs> but to, to some extent, though, like the, the threat intel you make yourself based on what you observe in your environment is, is the best kind of threat intel you will ever have. It's just naturally limited by how often are you attacked. <laughs> run pack in like my like soft spot it's all about like structured analysis like input be damned like if you don't have a methodical way of like give me an indicator from any in the world if you don't have a methodical and repeatable way of like how you vet it how you process it how you enrich it and like that the process is where you kind of clean it all up but like i love where you're going with the defender metric and the best thing i can think of is like it sucks but the best metric for i, I when i think of a blue team or like a sock is like silence like peace and that's a terrible metric but it's like how many days have we gone with like no dumpster fires that's like really hard to measure but like that's like kicking ass blue team keep going just follow along this chat good times in here yeah folks i mean love to hear some more questions or or insights from anybody here that's done some intel work maybe works with an intel team what have you seen work well what are some things that you think some orgs could be doing better and, and shoot, not to plug any products or platforms, but um, Jamie, I'm curious, um, what tips would you recommend for a team that's trying to get up off the ground, right? But, you know, you know, is is MISP still kind of the, the you know, one of the top ones for somebody to get into? Or is the learning curve a bit steep for some? Like, you know, there was one that's hit that hit socials the other day that so it's got a little bit of buzz around it. I'm not promoting it because I don't know anything about it, but I'm a uh, threat note. I don't know if you've if you've seen that one. But do you have any any personal favorites, ones that you recommend uh, teams that are maybe just getting started? Yeah. So not a, necessarily a huge hot take, but I think like thinking about a tip is like day 30, mm -hmm. like start in Excel. Like don't like, again, it's the same with every other analogy, like tools are a means for scaling and acceleration. I've seen too many orgs like, hey, we want to set up an Intel team. We bought a tip, we bought some feeds, we set up like all these integrations and now we're trying to figure out like, what the hell do I do with this? And like the analogy I think of, it's like, it's like if you were starting a restaurant and like you were founding a restaurant and you just went and bought a bunch of ingredients and bought a bunch of equipment, threw it in the kitchen, hired some chefs and were like, 
cook stuff. Like, you know, everything you have is here. Like, good luck. And that ends up looking more like a game show versus like, yeah. hey, start small. Like, are we a sushi joint? Hey, are we like a steakhouse? What are we specializing? Again, talk to your stakeholders. What are you hungry for? What are your, like, what kind of stuff do you like? Or do you want sandwiches, salads, whatever? Like water, doesn't matter. And now, like, once we figure, like, your your tip is going to be, like, your craft oven or, like, your sharp knives. Like, they're, like, means to an end. But if you start with just kind of, like, accessorizing, you're going to end up with a bunch of, like, crud and, like, paper. Love it. Effectively. So, I love it. I know. I think it's, it's like, there's a, probably a great meme out there. But, like, Excel is probably your day zero through day, you know, end I, tip, honestly. I dig it. I dig it a lot. I dig it a lot. That was that was the best answer to that question that I, I could have possibly expected because um, because you, I, I, you're right. Like the, one of the biggest problems I see security teams making in general is, you know, going and buying a solution looking for a problem, right? Like, okay, we bought this new thing. What do we do with it? Well, what problem existed in the first place? And it, now, now we're looking for the problem. Like, and so, um, but, but what I love about the Excel approach, even though some folks might scoff at that, but there's wisdom there. And saying that, hey, if we start in something ultra basic, we've got Excel or you know something super basic, we're going to learn the program, we're going to learn the processes, and then we're going to understand the problem that we will eventually need a solution for. And the better we understand the problem, the more informed decision we're going to make when we go looking to solve it versus just solving it right out of the gate. So I really like that, that, that mindset. In- if you give them exactly to your point, if you give enough time to, it's almost like math class when you had to do everything by hand and they're like, oh, by the way, there's a button on the calculator. And like, ah, oh, damn it. Like, but like, if you just take the time to learn it the low and slow way, like you're going to carve apart all those vendor demos because you're like, hey, I know exact, I, like, show me how you're better than Excel. Like what, even when you're doing open source, like MISP or open CTI, you might see like, oh, wow, this is like a lot of like time capital, just setting this up, sysadmin, all this crap. Like, is it even better than what we're able to do with our hands? And and I think that's where you start to really, like, again, to your point, make very, very surgical procurement decisions that you can stand behind, especially at the end of the year when budgets come up and you're like, ooh, like, why do we have all these fees? And again, kind of bring Intel away from just being, you know, a cost center. Hey, so we get a question in chat from Joshua. He says, what sort of questions do you ask your stakeholders? Most don't understand the wording Intel requirements. Love it. Um, do never talk to stakeholders about Intel requirements. That's a that's a work product that we use internally. I don't even don't even talk to them about Intel. Like I, the best thing you can do is speak their language. And that's why I'm a big fan of like job shadow. Like, hey, like go sit in on their meetings, go watch them do an op, do whatever they're doing. And kind of it's on you to think about, OK, like what are they how do they see the problem and how can I help? And then really, when we talk about like PIRs and information needs, you're really just deriving questions. Like, you know, if I'm watching like a red team do what they're doing, I'm like, how can I turn, like provide Intel support to that? I like, hey, how do they figure out what systems they're gonna assess? How do they do a tool selection? How do they, you know, dev out TTPs? And how can I like translate those questions into looking at my universe and kind of abstracting them from this problem and saying, now I'm gonna go put my Intel professional hat on. It's not their problem. I'm going to go look at the data I have and say, what, how can I translate the data I see into somewhat answers to the questions that I see them having? So, you know, and, and, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't never go to someone and say, what are your PIRs unless they are like, you know, in an Intel capacity. I think if you wanted to do something that kind of meet in the middle, especially for kind of scoping an Intel project, what might be good is like, let them know, Hey, I want to do insole support. I, you know, I, I want to kind of see how you work, job shadow, read their docs, whatever they have, and then maybe even boil it down to just like, here's five to 10 questions I think you have, and maybe show that to them. Like, hey, you don't need to worry about the lingo. Are those questions that you think resonate with you that would be helpful if I can help answer those? That's, that's really important because, again, you're setting expectations, but also you're defining kind of that abstraction level where like, hey... I don't want to go and do a bunch of research and a bunch of work and then surprise you and like, ta-da, here's this stuff. And they're like, what the hell is this? Um, versus like the way getting back to that restaurant analogy, it's almost like defining a menu where it's like, hey, you sat down in this restaurant. Here's what we have. Does this make sense? Okay, cool. Now you can point and click and say, I want this, 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 that one's kind of dumb or, or you can prioritize and saying, hey, I'm not, I can't answer all this stuff, but that one, give it to me as soon as you have it. This one once a week, this one once a quarter, and I'll let you know whenever I want this one. Like that's that kind of back and forth where, again, it's not just process flow. It's a really big and important cultural shift. 
where you're actually like ingraining Intel into the way people function. And I mean, getting back to the whole point of this, it's decision support. So you're really just structuring yourself to actually be involved in, you know, the actual mechanics of ops and business and everyone uh, doing their thing. I love it. I think I think you've got several fans now of your restaurant analogy here on this call. So thank you for sharing that, Jim, with us. Um, all right. I want to I want to use the last couple of minutes of this call to roll a grenade right into the uh, conversation here. So, Jamie, um, curious what your thoughts are. And let, let me let me get the whole thing out. I'm curious what your thoughts are about the new Microsoft, uh, the, the new controversial Microsoft feature um, uh, recall with Copilot. Right now. Now, let me finish that thought. Imagine the use case, because we could spend all day unpacking all of the reasons they shouldn't do this, right? I think everyone here has probably thought, thought it through and has read the tweets and, okay, 100 reasons why they shouldn't do it. But okay, do you see, though, any value in it from like a, a SOC analyst, a, a CTI analyst, you know, you know, folks doing security work, imagine some of the capabilities that, that this thing could offer. What are your honest thoughts on that? Do you, do you think this could be good? Do you think that the pros could outweigh the cons or do you think this thing should just go away and never come back again? What's that subreddit? It's like great idea, bad execution. I think that's like my take here is like we we clearly need more visibility. We need more help. Like, you know, we, we for a long time have had maybe a plateau of like what, especially for host based systems, like what visibility actually looks like. So I, I commend the spirit of the idea. And like to your point, it's like imagine doing like IR or forensic analysis and you actually have that wealth of data, like that's phenomenal. But it's like, I think we need to, again, with the classic like security versus privacy like paradigm, I think they need to take a couple of steps back and maybe assess the actual implementation. Um, and again, it's probably at least something that I think folks need to be very, very, you know, they need to be very, very transparent about what's being collected, how it's being collected and if it's enabled or not. But Again, I, I kind of, you know, whenever I look at something like this or product or feature or anything, I like to take a step back and say, like, what were they trying to do? Like, what was the catalyst for this? And I think it was in a good spirit, to your point. It's like, hey, we are trying to take a step towards, like, what's the next, like, realm of, like, what we can provide as a vendor or an operating system or an environment to our users with the heart of security. They just kind of, you know, maybe made a couple of oopsies and goofs on you know, maybe a little bit of too too aggressive on uh, maybe prototype zero. You know, John, I love I love what you just added there. That it's like it's kind of like when Apple released the Air Tags, right? It was a great idea initially, though there were some serious issues because it could be used for you know stalking people, whatever. But if you notice, they kind of came back around and said, okay, now we're coming up with all these sort of mitigations to those those concerns. And I hope Microsoft does the same thing because I, I, that's a super thoughtful response, Jamie. I, I, I loved it. That was that was really great, really awesome way of kind of seeing both sides of the picture there. And uh, and that that fairly well summarizes kind of my thoughts and feelings on it too. But, uh, but all right, folks, we are at the top of the hour. Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. This was an awesome chat. Like, and, and I'm really, really kind of, I just love the way the universe aligns from time to time. I, I did not know you before until you and I exchanged a couple tweets. And I just, I don't know, something about your vibe. I was like, this guy needs to come on Defender Fridays. And man, was I right. You were an awesome guest. So thank you so much. I hope you'll join us um, in the future again. And I can't wait to hear what you move on to next. So keep us posted on that. I'd love, yeah. to, love to find out what you end up doing next after you probably take some well-earned uh, R&R. <laughs> Folks, be sure to join us in Slack, slack.limacharlie.io. Every week, we're throwing out a cool Defender Fridays t-shirt to a lucky winner. We've sent out probably dozens of these now. So I'm, my hope is that Eventually, everybody on this call has one, and uh, and that'd be super cool to see. See you all same time, same place next weekend. Take care, everyone.